Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask of a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater <coughs> than our ancestor Jacob? who gave us the well and with his sons and flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, Call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, The hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, Well, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many of them believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And peace be with those of you worshiping at home who are listening to the recording of this later. We are with you. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is in this story. And it's the verse that our Wellspring ministry here at Trinity, uh, for newcomers, um, it's the verse that that ministry is named after, and it's verse 14 where Jesus says, the water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Some translations 
say, the water I, will, I give them will become in them a wellspring gushing up to eternal life. And I chose it for wellspring, that name, uh, in that verse, because of its connection to baptism, uh, the, the waters of baptism becoming a wellspring of life gushing up within us. Often those journeying in wellspring are journeying toward either baptism or affirming or renewing their baptism. <coughs> I also like this uh, verse because it's an image of discipleship. This idea that there would be a spring of water gushing up within us. Our Lenten study book, uh, if you're here during this season, um, has some commentary on this verse. This is from page 83. It says, while it's great to come together for teaching, training, and encouragement, it's also important to remember that you are called to be a well, not a bucket. You, individually, are called to be or to have, I might say, have a well within you and not just a bucket. Eternal life is like a spring that bubbles up within you, and it's more important for you to uncover that well in your own life than it is for you to go and get filled up from someone else's well. It is always, of course, important to live in community, <coughs> community <coughs> in every stage of our lives. But Jesus' design is that each one of us would have such an intimate connection with God that we don't have to depend on others to teach and lead us. That as we read the scriptures, the Holy Spirit uh, teaches us and reveals to us insights and new tr elements of truth in God's word. And that in times of difficulty, you don't have to always run immediately to someone else for help but you have the resources within yourself to cope. And that that wellspring of life would then become a fountain of gifts to share with others as well. This is Jesus' design, that we would all be able to have, that we, that we all do have a wellspring of life gushing up within ourselves. Of course, it's always important to live life in community together, uh, but we can develop the spiritual maturity and resources within ourselves to sustain us in both good and difficult times. Now, it's not that we should all be at this level of maturity immediately in our walk with God. This is a goal, uh, something to move toward in our relationship with God. The question is, how do we get there? And the answer to that is a paradox. The journey towards spiritual self-sufficiency is never a solo journey. We get there, we get to personal spiritual maturity by living in community. It's a journey of discipleship, of submitting yourself to living life in community and learning from others. And so this is the life of discipleship that Jesus offers to this woman that he invites her into. And through this story, Jesus is inviting us into a deeper life of discipleship and developing, uncovering the wellspring of life within us as well. And so let's dive into the story a little bit. In the first section, uh, we see misunderstanding. Jesus and this woman are on different pages. They're not quite having the same conversation. The woman thinks Jesus is talking about water. She thinks they're having a conversation about water. And uh, Jesus is talking about something different. And often, <clears throat> when we first encounter Christ, when we first uh, interact with him and, and hear uh, the message of Jesus, we don't quite understand what he's getting at or, or what he's all about. Or we might have slight misunderstandings as to what the message is all about. Well, then the conversation takes an unexpected turn. Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come back. And she answers, I don't have a husband. And she says, you're right, you've had five. Well, that was an unexpected turn in the conversation. Jesus engages her in an unexpected and uncomfortable way. If we are open, open to hearing Jesus' voice in our own lives, Jesus often engages us in unexpected and perhaps uncomfortable ways. The Christian life is about growth. And so we, in a relationship with Jesus, are going to be confronted with things in our own lives that are not perfect. Areas in which God is calling us to move forward and, 
And the Holy Spirit is beckoning growth out of us for us to uncover uh, that, that wellspring in our own life. And so the Christian journey is about movement and growth. And sometimes in order for that growth to take place, we are going to be conf- confronted with uncomfortable truths. We want to engage Jesus on our own terms, but he won't have it. He's asking us for submission. He wants us to move toward making him Lord of all of our lives, our entire life, not just one priority among many. And so as their conversation continues, more and more of the woman's life (coughs) gets revealed. We have the sense as we're reading that there is questions that lie just beneath the surface that are that go deeper than the conversation about water. Questions of identity. Questions of belonging. But when she starts to get uncomfortably close to the answers to those questions, and she realizes the answers may result in a significant change in the way she lives her life, she does what many of us would do. She changes the topic. In verse 20, She starts talking vaguely about religion. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say the place where people are supposed to worship is in Jerusalem. And well, we can't possibly both be right. So we might hear people today or we ourselves might do this to redirect the conversation away from the discomfort into vague religious talk so that we don't have to actually engage with our own hearts and confront the things in our lives that need changing. Well, there are so many religions in the world, and we couldn't possibly know which one is true, so... Or, well, there's so many translations of the Bible, and so many copies after copies and copies, and we don't even have the original manuscripts, and we can't possibly be sure what the Bible actually said, so... Or, well, I grew up in church, but I moved away, and I tried churches... But this one wasn't very welcoming, and I I didn't like the pastor at this one, and the people weren't very nice at this one, and so, 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 so. In the end, what comes after the so in all of those statements is, so I have an out, and I don't have to do anything. And we can continue to make excuses. And no, the church is not perfect, And no denomination does have it 100% right. But the church is not God. And God still has a claim on your life as your creator, as your redeemer, and as the one who gives you life each and every day. But the woman still avoids getting into that level of depth saying, well, one day the Messiah will come and sort everything out. I'll just wait till then. Jesus looks at her and says, I'm right here. And we might say, well, one day I'll die, or one day Jesus will come and everything will be sorted out then. But Jesus says, but I'm here now. And I long to be in relationship with you now. I long to lead you to grow into the person that God has made you to be. I want you to grow as my disciple. To uncover that wellspring of life gushing up within you. And the way to do that is by living in community with my imperfect, on the way to being redeemed, sometimes very frustrating church. Sometimes another set of excuses comes out. The feeling of, well, God wouldn't possibly want me. I'm nobody special. Or, (coughs) well, you don't know what I've done. God couldn't possibly forgive the things that are in my past. Well, in the context of this story, historically, everything about Jesus even talking with this woman is wrong. She's got multiple strikes against her in the culture of being worthy of being addressed by a Jewish rabbi. First, she's a woman. And unfortunately, in this historical context, 
That meant a strike against her already. There were all kinds of bad reasons why men and women didn't interact in public one-on-one. The fear of, by men of the risk of impurity, according to Jewish law, in interacting with the woman in a fear of, of gossip, what will those in the community <coughs> think? <clears throat> a fear of immorality that comes from, came from scapegoating women as the cause of that immorality. So that's the first strike against her in this culture. The second strike, she's a Samaritan. Um, we, won't, we don't have time to get into all of the reasons that Jews and Samaritans didn't get along But one rabbi in the ancient world said that a Jew should not even be touched by a Samaritan's shadow. That's the disdain that they had for Samaritans. And it wasn't because they had a coronavirus or they were maintaining social distancing. It's sad the way we can create divisions among ourselves with any difference we can find, including racial and ethnic differences. Finally, the third strike against her was that she was coming to draw water in the heat of the day. This shows that she had deep shame in relation to the other women in her town. The typical way would be for all all the women to come together at, at dawn, at the beginning of the day, to gather the water they needed for the whole day so that they wouldn't have to come And when the sun was high and the heat was in the middle of the day. And so she has deep shame in relating to those in her community, probably having something to do with these five husbands that she's had. Well, Jesus crosses all of these man-made boundaries. And yes, in this case, I do literally mean man-made boundaries. In order to call this woman into God's family. And he tells this woman and is telling you today, I don't care what you've done. And I don't care, it doesn't matter who you are. You have a place in God's family. You are a daughter of the king, a son of the king. And there's nothing you could do or that could happen to you that could remove that identity, that core of who you are. The number one image that Jesus uses in the Gospel of John for God is Father. For Jesus, God is a loving parent. God's identity is not lawgiver, law keeper, law enforcer. God's identity is loving parent, loving father. And so asking, well, how could God still love me? How could God forgive me? It's sort of like asking, how could my moms love me? How could my mother love me? And yes, I know, I realize that some have had broken relationships with their parents in the course of their lives. They haven't always felt that parental love, but we still have that inherent expectation of parental love, which is why it's so devastating when that relationship is broken. And so even if we have experienced brokenness in relationship with our earthly parents, we still have an inherent understanding of what that relationship should be or could be. And that's what it is with God, the ultimate loving parent. Many people in these coming weeks might be spending more time with family, certainly than they had expected, maybe than they ever wanted to. Hopefully they have relatively good family relationships so that time will go well. But if not, maybe this will be of some encouragement. The questions of belonging and identity, like those that are just beneath the surface in Jesus' conversation with this Samaritan woman. Those questions at the core of who we are are not sufficiently answered within the traditional nuclear family. We need something more. We long, if you you really look into the depths of your hearts, you'll see that you long for something more that can't be met 
in just the traditional nuclear family. As great as families can be, they don't satisfy our longings completely. And if we attempt to find our ultimate fulfillment in those relationships, we look to our family for something it was never meant to provide. We need something more. Our true identity and a true sense of belonging and true purpose for our lives can only be found in our relationship with God. In a life lived as a disciple of Jesus, a life lived as part of God's wider family, a family on a mission. And you have a place in that family. So how will your story end? We see the end, or at least the next part of this woman's story. Her heart was softened by Jesus' offer of living water, by the revealing of who he was. And she stopped making excuses. And then she couldn't help but become a witness, telling others about him and about how he had transformed her heart, how she was finding identity and belonging and purpose in him. So what about you? Will you drink of the water that Jesus gives and let it become a wellspring within you gushing up to eternal life. Amen.